thing I would say we have learned that the approach needs to be much more heterogeneous and much more varied. And, you know, I think at the time we were, you know, gloriously simple in our approach. There's going to be a climate change act and a carbon price and then, you know, we'd all go and do something else because that would be sort of decarbonisation for the UK. And I think what we've learned over time is that when you look at the different parts of the sector that need to change, you need to have more focused regulation and more activity to make sure you can drive the change as efficiently as you possibly can over time. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. This episode consists of two parts, with this being part one. For part two, keep an eye on our podcast feed. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Feddersen, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And on the show today, I'll be speaking with the person in charge of making and enforcing the rules in the UK's energy markets. Uh, One of the key architects of electricity policy in the UK over the last decade, and perhaps one of the deepest experts uh, in the UK on the electricity system. My guest on the show is Jonathan Brearley, uh, CEO of Ofgem, which is the Office of Gas and Electricity Markets. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, looking forward to it. Great. And, and by way of background, a broader background, Jonathan is a mathematician and physicist by training. Uh, he is, in terms of his career trajectory, he was, I suppose, a policy generalist who became a policy specialist, uh, having started his public sector career in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit under Tony Blair, uh, and uh, before then focusing on energy and climate change through the Office of Climate Change, subsequently uh, the Department of Energy and and Climate Change, and now Ofgem. And he was a Bain consultant at the start of his career. Jonathan, if I may uh, briefly, what what is it that, if you were to say it in in a few words, what is it that Ofgem does? What's your role? So the Ofgem does two things. It makes sure that customers in the markets today, their interests are protected, um, and we make sure that people are treated fairly, but equally, we are playing a big part in leading the transition to tackling climate change and getting this country to its climate targets of net zero by 2050. Thanks. And it's interesting, the, um, we may pick this up later. Uh, you know, if you'd spoken to a former CEO of Ofgem, you know, going back five or 10 years, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say the emphasis would have been much more on the, on the consumers. And that's not to say it's less on them now uh, and much less on Ofgem's role in tackling climate change. So it seems like quite a, quite a transition that hopefully we'll, we'll pick up later in the discussion. Sure. Before, before we get to that, can I just talk a little bit about your career? And I'm interested in the strategy unit. And now, as I understand it, this was a sort of a, 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 a Tony Blair government creation to sort of centralise intelligence and, and analysis. So the, the first thing I'm interested in is what were your, what were your focus areas there? What, what sorts of policy were you focusing on in that role? Well, look, I mean, the the PMSU was a unit that allowed you to wander far and wide across policy. So I worked on everything from prison reform through to pensions, through to local services like, for example, youth services and childcare. Um, It might be worth just stepping back a bit, John, because I I started my career at Bain and, and I really enjoyed it and it taught me a lot. But Bain at the time was very, very private sector focused. So I, I almost consider that that I had my training and I always looked at government as an opportunity to work, but was fearful of some of the things that are in some of the debate now, you know, is it going to be too slow moving? Am I going to be able to get anything done? And the PMSU really provided me the opportunity to take those skills I had from Bain. It, it operated a little bit um, in a model of a consultancy. And our job really was to work on issues that span departments. So issues that really fell between two of the big departments to help develop a sort of coordinated strategy. Yeah. And really, you know, for me, it was what I described as my first dream job. You know, you could do what you wanted, you could move as fast as you wanted, and you really could make a huge difference in a short space of time. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, um, and, and I, I, I confess, I spent a little bit of time in the Australian Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, which yeah. was essentially predicated on the, essentially copying the British one. And one of my earliest jobs was copying the sort of sure start centers, which I think Tony Blair always said was one of the things he was most 
most uh, most proud of. So, so I certainly been emulated elsewhere in the world. So on the centralization point, I, I sometimes hear criticism of the current government around the centralization of of decision making in a sense and look i suspect every every government's been criticized for centralization of decision making uh, by, by by some what do you think the virtues are in that is it about sort of spanning departments where things might fall through the gaps uh, are there other are there other virtues in in that sort of structure so i think first and foremost it doesn't matter how you arrange government government you know when you add it all up is enormous and I do think there is merit in taking some of those issues that span departments and trying to find a more integrated way to work. And I do think, you know, the PMSU and, and the Cabinet Office as such was, was very good at doing that, putting sufficient analytical resource in, you know, usually in combination with the departments involved, to come out with something that then says, OK, rather than focusing on what the communities and local government department will do, what the health department will do, will tackle outcomes for vulnerable families, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me, is a really, really strong advantage. It's not the only way to do things, but it's certainly one that can drive a lot of progress. I suppose, secondly, and honestly, I think if you are a prime minister that wants to drive change and you're finding it hard to have effect, it is useful to have a unit there that can help sort of bring people together and think through how you might make some of the more radical and some of the more fundamental changes. Yeah. I mean, there is a downside. And the one thing I would say, and the one thing I really learned from the PMSU more than anywhere else, is it doesn't matter where you are in the, in the map, in the landscape, building really strong relationships with people and understanding where they are coming from is fundamentally important. So if you walked into the PMSU thinking, I work for the Prime Minister of the time, people are just going to do what I say, you'd find it very difficult to have an impact. You only really have an impact. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And so you and so you uh, you worked on all these different areas: prison reform, sure, start centres, various things like that. And you decided you wanted to specialise. Uh, it, it sounds like you know, climate change and energy. Why? Why? You know, you're a mathematician, physicist. You've you've done you've done your first dream job, which I suppose was defined by its breadth. Why specialise, and why that particular area? Look, I, I don't know if at the time, if you'd asked me that I was choosing to specialise, I, I would have consciously known that's what I was doing. And, and um, in a sense, I, you know, I, I came into to, to climate change and energy almost by accident. So I'd worked with David Miliband on local government reform. He then became the DEFRA, so the Environmental Secretary of State. And, and he, faced, he faced a problem. He faced being a Secretary of State with a department that simply didn't have any of the policy or regulatory levers to get the outcome, tackling climate change, that he thought he ought to be driving. And so he asked me initially to come and set up the Office of Climate Change. And it was meant to be a sort of scoping exercise, a design exercise, and then we were gonna hand it over. <laughs> but it was so much momentum that I stayed there for four and a half years. And, and just to say, I do think that was my, you know, that's another job that I considered to be a dream job. It was a great time to be in climate change and energy. It was where the political awareness of the issue had grown. And coming out of the Office of Climate Change came, for example, the Climate Change Act, which, mm -hmm. which was, a, was a, you know, a piece Amazing. of which we put together very quickly, um, but also in a very different kind of way. You know, we worked across departments. We were very transparent. We were very open. And we pushed ourselves on being sort of analytically robust. So we almost yeah. took that PMSU model and said, let's focus it on one area and see what we can do with it there. Yeah, it's always the so, so, so fear of some consultants that are your people who are developing the plan that you might actually be asked to Im implement it is the is, is, a, is a fear during the process. So, but I think it's good good discipline to actually be forced to implement it. I didn't know that uh, that, that your involvement in the climate change act. Did you just to digress on that? Did you envisage it would turn out the way it? Uh, the principles were there, but you know, did you envisage it would turn out the way it did? And I suppose another one other question is what one thing would you change about the Climate Change Act, looking back on it now? I think we were aware of its significance. It seemed to move incredibly fast. So it just felt like it was, frankly, politically the right time to be doing this. There was, a, you know, the, to be open, the, the idea came from NGOs. The idea from NGOs wasn't really practically applicable. So we spent, our job really was to turn the fundamental concept, which was, how do we hold a government to account more clearly yeah. for its trajectory to its long-term goal? So the problem had always been, if you commit to something 20, 30, 40 years out, 
then how on earth does, does anybody who cares see whether you're really driving towards that? So this idea of these five-year carbon budgets plus this organisation, the Committee on Climate Change, to understand progress, to verify what you're doing and to suggest what the, the new interim carbon budgets or targets should be was all part of that package where we really went from a government that was totally sceptical about the idea to a government that thought we can make this work. And, you know, one of my, you know, my favourite moments in my career was seeing both the special advisors and the officials come to the view that we had something we thought that we could, we could implement. In terms of change, I think that the, I, I think the Act has probably got the right balance of accountability in it. So, so to be open, we thought about models that were, were very, very hard edged. So the Committee on Climate Change became almost like the Bank of England. Yeah. And the price would be the thing that they set, and they'd set that according to economic conditions and trajectory to, to 2050. And frankly, that was and, and is far too rigid. Yeah. I, yeah, I, don't, I, agree. I don't think I would change anything in, in the Act itself. The thing I would say that we have learned is that the approach needs to be much more heterogeneous and much more varied. And, you know, I think at the time we were, you know, gloriously simple in our approach. There's going to be a climate change act and a carbon price. And then, you know, we'd all go and do something else because that would be sort of decarbonisation for the UK. And I think what we've learned over time is that when you look at the different parts of the sector that need to change, you need to have more focused regulation and more activity to make sure you can drive the change as efficiently as you possibly can over time. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm pretty comfortable. The only thing I would say is I don't think it's been tested in anger um, as a yeah. framework. I don't think we've had a government yet that has really said, actually, do you know what? I'm not going to try and meet the targets that are being set. I think we've got a government with you know, varying success, but all of whom are publicly committed to getting to where we need to get to. Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting point about being tested in anger. And I think it's a, it's a luxury position to an extent the UK has been in for a number of years to have bipartisan support on climate change. In a sense, political parties trying to outdo each other on how deeply they're going to decarbonise the... Um, Again, the Australian government set up something similar, actually tried to, but it, um, it, 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 it was tested and I think in many ways failed, uh, failed the test of, um, you know, part partisanship in climate change policy. Um, interesting. So I asked, I, I asked the same question to Lord Deben, the chair of the CCC, about the Climate Change Act. And he, his, his big lament was... Uh, there wasn't enough guaranteed funding for the Committee on Climate Change, which he may be talking his own book there. Do, do you, do you they think... have his own incentives there, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think they're doing, they're doing fine, but that was a <laughs> big, big challenge. Um, EMR. So, so fast forward a little bit. So you, you, you've been heavily involved in the drafting of probably the most important climate change legisl legislation in, in the UK. And then you've gone to the Department of uh, Energy and Climate Change, as it was known, then and you've devised the electricity market reforms which i suppose seven years on i'm you know it's it, it's pretty striking that a policy that set out that framework you know capacity market for electricity cfds is still you know popular i think and and in essentially the same shape what was you know, what was it like when you were draft? You know, what was it like when you were drafting it? What enabled you to succeed in producing the electricity market reforms? So I think the thing that we did, and we did early, was we got much more pragmatic about the change we wanted to see. And this kind of comes back to to what I was describing with the Climate Change Act. As I say, you know, government was full of quite. Um, sort of theoretical and somewhat abstract kind of economists trying to tackle this problem. And so we would talk in, you know, in broad terms about sort of broad mechanisms. And if you look at the renewables obligation, it started out as a very principal mechanism that got more practical over time as we realized, you know, it was just different what you had to pay offshore wind compared to what yeah. you had to wind, for example. And what we did was we simply lined up you know, the, almost the first few meetings on EMR was lining up the investment that we thought we needed uh, with an estimate, if we did nothing, of the costs that would be there, combined with projections of supply. And it's, it's funny in the world we're in now, but if you go back to 2011, 2012, or even before that, 2009, 2010, there were real concerns with the coal coming off. Every October, the press would talk about blackouts. It was, a, it was, a, it was an annual sport. Exactly, exactly. And so we just put those two problems out and then we said, OK, well, what are the different ways in which you can solve them? What's the best way to solve the investment challenge? 
for the low carbon component and how we best should we best secure security of supply. And I think the really simple thing about EMR and that there's, there's two parts of the CFDs in my mind that work and there's lots of dozens, there's lots of things we could have done differently. But one was we said, okay, how do you minimize financing costs for a, what are basically very, very big capital investments with pretty low operating costs, certainly in this stage of decarbonization. Um, and secondly, well, how do you drive out the best price? And it's that combination of a, you know, at a high level a relatively simple instrument with a clear price for an investor combined with an auction that says to the investor, you're gonna have to compete to get this opportunity that mm. drove down, you know, almost, you know, quite remarkably in offshore wind costs from three times today's electricity price to one that's, you know, pretty much equivalent and, and we all expect to go lower over time. So, so it felt as if we, we sort of had our arms around the problem in a very clear way. And similarly on the capacity side, um, you know, the capacity market was not a new invention. It's one that's used in many markets around the world, as John's I'm sure you know. What we did was we went through a very similar process of saying, well, what fits here? And how can we get the assurance that we need that as we're going through what is absolutely going to be a bumpy and choppy change in generation, we can make sure that, um, that the customers are protected as well as they could be. The thing that we didn't know, and the phase we went through was there was a huge amount of complexity in implementing that. But I think the end result, the concepts still, still stand. Okay, I'll ask you about that in a second. It's, it, it, it's a striking point you make about the sort of the, the you know, you talk, you, uh, I, I'm an economist and we get blamed for being too theoretical all the time, the sort of <laughs> theoretical economists. So it's sort of, to me, and, and, you know, I see a lot of power markets. It's the best argument for capacity markets, I think, is not a theoretical one. And you can talk about whether an energy only market will deliver the same sort of price signal. It's, yeah. it's just that if the lights are going out, you cannot do any other sensible policy um, because you're going to be totally distracted by that. So if you can, if you can move security of supply off the table as an issue, uh, then all of a sudden you can start to get creative elsewhere. And it's, it's, I think it is one of those areas where economists can sometimes be a little bit blinkered by um, trying to get an extra percent or two of theoretical efficiency <laughs> rather than um, solving the fundamental, the fundamental policy problem. Are these still the right instruments, the CFDs and the, um, and the, and the, and the capacity market? And I suppose, you know, com combined with the wholesale market that we, that we have. And, and I suppose one, one slightly deeper question on that is, can we, so you talked about offshore wind and the, and the, and the declines in cost. Can we expect the CFDs to do similar things for the new technologies that we need, like CCUS and, and hydrogen? So um, on the first question, I think the, the transition we're going through is, is too fundamental to say that any, any combination of market structures or, or, or instruments is, is going to be enduring. You know, we are, we're continuing to see changes in the cost base of the stuff that, that is providing our energy use. We're seeing an increased value in the capacity of customers, us customers at the other end, being able to shift our use to match what are naturally more intermittent and variable sort of sources of power. So I don't think we'll ever be able to say, right, this is it. We're you know, the steady state from now on and it's just tinkering. I think we need to continue to push ourselves to make sure that we are delivering that transition at least cost. I'm happy to talk about some of the things you might look at there. Um, I wouldn't get too hung up on the instrument. I think the principles behind EMR absolutely could help CCUS and hydrogen. And if you take CCUS, what do you, what do you really have? You have an appendage to a power station. If it's a power station that's attached to CCUS or, or indeed it's something that's breaking up methane and you have a bunch of pipes and storage place. Well, you know, the principles of having something that's very high capex um, and has relatively low operating costs in terms of what's coming in and out could well lend itself to something which could either be a CFD or you could do it through some form of more regulated structure closer to the way we deal with networks. So I think there's, there's, there's plenty of different ways of doing things. The things you've got to hold on to are the things that you think will drive clarity for investors, but also drive a, a price for customers. Mm -hmm. um, good. And we'll come back to the, the markets, hope, hopefully, and the networks um, shortly. Just one final question on, I suppose, your, your journey. The, I often hear from people in government that 
you know, it's, it's harder to attract talent when you're at a, you're not at a central agency, you know, everyone wants to be in, in uh, the foreign, foreign office or DFID or, or, or the treasury. Um, and it's harder to get people to say the energy department or, or, um, or, or whatever it is, education, something like that. I had, I had one, uh, someone from one of the utilities say there aren't many Brealies in bays anymore to me a few weeks ago. <laughs> how, how, how do you go about that? And I suppose off gem is the same in a sense, you, you, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not the treasury um, in a sense, a vital role playing a massive, you know, massive role. How do you attract talent? Is it a challenge? Is it a fundamental challenge? No, look, I, I think it is. I think there's two challenges there. One is sort of public versus private sector. Um, and the other is, you know, how do we, how do we stack up and how do we compete with what else is going on in the public sector? But I think the, the advantage we have and the incredible thing we have is an amazing task and an amazing mission as an organization. Um, yep. When I talk about my first dream job, I do see the job I'm doing now as my, I don't know, it's my second or my third dream job in total. But I, I love what we do. And I love what we do because I can't think of anywhere um, in the public sector estate, including Treasury, where you really can have the impact we have, not just on people's lives today. So, for example, in the COVID crisis, making sure some of our poorest and most vulnerable customers on prepayment meters get access to energy. But mm. also, we are driving this fundamental change to the UK economy, which if we succeed will be something that is talked about for, you know, for many, many years afterwards. And I think the key to it is, is demonstrating and being very open about that mission and your passion behind it. Mm. And I do think, I think you're right. We struggle, we struggle in the public sector. We also struggle as, as, as regulators. Um, and I must admit when I joined Ofgem, my image of Ofgem was not, match to the scale of what Ofgem does actually. It was only when I got inside. Yeah. I remember the first meeting, I was in the networks team, my first meeting, and I sat down with them and I said, just add up all the funding you are dealing with on behalf of everybody else. And mm. over the last eight years, it's about, if you add on everything we're doing, it's about 100 billion pounds in total. So yeah. this organization, this team is on behalf of the British customer, making some fundamental changes, not only to how much we spend, is it value for money, but also what it does. And when I think of those offshore wind farms coming up, when I think of the connection we just agreed to Scotland, and indeed when I think of the changes we've got in terms of the way we're going to buy and sell energy in the future, uh, it's amazing to be part of that. But I, I think you've got to talk about that and, and, and help people engage with that and then, you know, and then talk about sort of your statutory role and everything else as, as part of it. And perhaps in the past we've done the first rather than the second. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Do you, just a digression, I mean, do you find that you now attract people who really want to decarbonize? So in a sense, is there a sort of, you know, if, if, you know there's an optimal amount of decarbonization, right? It's not, we don't want to go to zero tomorrow um, and we don't want to, we, you know, we, we don't want the world to, to, to overheat. Do, do you have any problem in terms of sort of independence and the people you, you recruit, uh, you know, wanting to really decarbonize quickly? So I think that, you know, without a doubt, one of the things I did when I, when I got the CEO job was I just spent sort of afternoons, as anyone would tell you in the building, just wandering around both London and Glasgow office and Cardiff, talking through, just talking to people about, you know, what motivated and what excited them. And I'd say it's that balance. It's really interesting. There are people who are absolutely committed to decarbonisation. Um, and there are also people who are, very thoughtful about the vulnerable customers we serve. And indeed there are yeah. within our teams, people that are very passionate about kind of sort of keeping the system robust and safe. Um, the thing I would say about Ofgem is although we are very, very sort of mission orientated, very focused on, on that bigger task, we're also quite technical. And so, you know, the realities of how you do this, how you make it change means that what we ultimately come up with is pretty balanced. But, but if I had to say, you know, if you were to ask the average off dem person, what are you here for? Then decarbonisation is absolutely up there, not the top thing they're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. Maths, maths and uh, being explicit about your assumptions is a good way to kind of balance your, balance your perspectives in a sense, I think. And it's, as you say, it's, um, it's pretty complicated. Uh, you know, I think it, it, what strikes me, as, as you say, I think it surprises a lot of people. That actually, it's the, you know, the grid code is what shifts value around. That's what an investor cares about. You know, a politician will turn up to a, an election and say, okay, I'm going to decarbonize by 20% or 25%, uh, or I'm going to build X gigawatts of renewables. But that's the level that a politician has to campaign on. As soon as you go any deeper, 
um, that no one's listening. And, and it's actually, there's a whole bunch of really important decisions that have cost implications and carbon implications that are, that are made essentially by, you know, by Ofgem, by Bayes, uh, to, to an extent that, um, that matter enormously. Absolutely. And, and, and my view is ne never more so than the moment we're in. So no, think, yeah, exactly. Getting cost parity and they're all beginning to say, you know, we can, we can probably survive in the market without necessarily different forms of support. Um, you know, the way you shift your network costs around, the way you deal with new entrants into a market, all of those details are things that Ofgem, you know, has a bailiwick over and really does drive decision making on. And that's why, you know, our work, you know, being independent but working closely with government is so important because it's got to be in consumer interest for the system to match the ambition of change as a whole and, and that's really what we're trying to achieve one thing i did between government and Ofgem was i spent time advising investors and as you say john you know there's lots of questions about the direction of policy there's at least a similar amount about the details of specific aspect a b and c of, of regulation of codes or indeed of of things like CFD that, that really matter because that's where your money comes from. Yeah, yeah. Good example recently is uh, the targeted charging review of Ofgem and, and, and the implications that had, had for, for, for a number of people. Um, and I tell yes. you, it certainly isn't getting any simpler, I think. over It'll be a while before the markets get simpler, I, I think. I hope they do at some point. Um, can you tell me a bit about right. Ofgem and COVID? Um, so you've, uh, I, as I understand, you've been working remotely. Uh, well, most people have been working remotely for a, for a long period of time. But broadly speaking, how has COVID impacted your, your work? So I think that we, you know, we, we found our feet with COVID in some sense. I mean, it's a horrendous situation. And, you know, like everyone, both the organisation and the sector really grappled with the scale of change that was happening. So, you know, if you go back to February, started my first day on the, on the I think it was the 2nd of February, launched a decarbonisation plan, and then suddenly we were hit with something that, although we'd seen it beginning to come, was, was a shock to us as it was a shock to everyone. And I think what we did as a regulator was we realised early on that we had a really important and fundamental role to play in this. And the thing that I want to celebrate, and the thing that I think we should all keep hold of, is the regulator, the industry, and government worked incredibly collaboratively and incredibly closely together to find a way through what were some enormously difficult issues. And, and I think we did that in a way that meant for, for a bit, we dropped our organizational boundaries, and we actually thought to ourselves, what are the important things we need to focus on, and how do we make sure we get those done? And I think for me and for Ofgem, it made me realize that not only do we have an important technical role, we have an important voice in the market and we need to be using that and we need to be building on that sense of collaboration as we come out of this and as we get through things like green recovery and we build that transition I've been describing. Can you say a bit more about how you're managing engagement with the industry? You know, a big, a big part of... Uh, I suppose a big part of your role is hearing different perspectives and you know, you're a rule maker in a sense, but, but there's a, there's a process by which people feed into the rulemaking process. Has the, has the absence of face to face contacted, you know, contact inhibited your, your ability to do that sort of consultation? Well, look, I really miss the face to face contact we all used to have. I'm hoping that we will be able to get back to it pretty quickly, um, both internally and externally actually. And so to some extent, there is bound to be a cost. You know, you can't spend the time you would have spent. Um, you can't sort of engage personally in the way perhaps that you would have done. But it's also given us a very different way of operating, which I'm hoping to keep hold of. And I describe it in kind of two ways. I think, you know, when, when talking to CH CEOs, as I think you and I talked about, John, John, earlier, when talking to CEOs, the normal way in which a CEO of Ofgen would operate is to have quite long meetings with quite involved agendas, where someone has usually had to travel for half a day to get to you. And these meetings felt a little bit ceremonial, a little bit slow. And what we've done since COVID is we've actually put in much shorter, much more regular meetings between myself and CEOs across the different parts of, of the sector. And that's produced sort of an incredibly different dynamic. So I feel much closer to the ground as to what's happening. In some ways, I feel as if I've built a much stronger relationship with the relevant CEOs. Um, and I think that gives us a, a greater sense of dynamism. So when we get back to steady state, what I don't want to do is to kind of slip back into the way we worked before, but to take that forward and think, more, you know, think a little bit differently about how we might have a much more flexible and interactive sort of conversation with the companies involved. 
the other thing the other thing is internally you know internally we had to make some very big decisions very quickly and having come in saying wants us to be more flexible and faster moving frankly we had a live experiment where we tried to do that so the same thing we want to do with we did with covid we want to do for example with green recovery which is where we can moving at pace and making sure that we we keep pace with the changes that are appearing across the economy and across the sector we have flattened our management structure so we are broader we are much more horizontal than we've ever been before and that's all part of the same aim which is to make ourselves get ourselves ready for this transition and the pace of change that we all know is going on out there and do you think would, would the flattening of the management structure have happened irrespective of covid or was it in, influenced i suppose it could be both i mean it was consulted on just before sort of covid came in so that i put out the first version of that on the first day i think what covid has shown me though is how we can make that work and and indeed you know without going through the details of it all we now have committed we had a halfway house previously we now have committed to something that is fully horizontal with you know a group of senior leaders so i do expect to be in charge of their relevant areas the the other covid point that comes up a bit in the press is sort of how how are retailers how are suppliers coping uh, you know i think there's an open question about what happens when government furlough scheme support um, concludes how are you seeing you know covid's impacts on suppliers and retailers at, at the moment do you have a sense of do you have a sense of where people are and do you think they're in an in an okay shape so look, I mean, as you can imagine, one of the, the day one questions that we had to face was what was going to happen to retailers if people couldn't pay their bills. And, and when you began to look at some of the very early scenarios, you combined that with you know, operations that might lose a large number of people for self-isolation reasons, for reasons of childcare or reasons of, of, of health. Um, it was a very, very difficult picture. Now, what we did very early on and where we added a lot of value was we, we, we put our financial experts into each of the companies or we got, we got information from each of the companies for our financial experts to look at. And we now have a very regular and ongoing assessment of the state of the retail market. And all I would say is that we haven't seen some of those kind of worst case scenarios played through. And, you know, we are in a position where you can never say a supplier won't fail. We're in a market and, and in any market, retailers might fail, but we're not seeing the sort of systemic issue that we feared when we start. So in a sense, that's good. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. And, I, and I'd say this to my teams quite often, you know, there's a sense that we're coming out of COVID to some extent in terms of the, you know, the easing of lockdown, et cetera. But as you mentioned, we won't really see the financial implications for those companies until we see the economic change that has happened that will happen in the second half of this year, both as, as schemes end, but also as you know the economic impact of, of, of the COVID situation plays through. So we're keeping a watch in brief. That was Jonathan Brearley, CEO of Ofgem, with John Federson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, asking the questions. In the second half of this interview, Jonathan will be talking more broadly about Ofgem, its long-term focus areas and its environmental perspective, and about networks and energy markets. It will appear on our podcast feed on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud and Spotify. You'll also find more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. Thanks for listening and goodbye.